So today, I want to talk about how we can make a change. I want to talk about how we can improve our workplaces, increase innovation, better our lives and ourselves. Today, I want to talk about diversity and equity and being open-minded and building each other up. And not just for underrepresented groups and minorities, but for all of us as a collective, so that we can move forward and make a real and valuable change together. So, who am I? I am a queer, half-Asian woman in engineering, studying how we can build sustainable pharmaceutical industries using alternative solvents. And I'm really grateful to be able to speak to you today because I believe that we can make a change and move past the historical status quo that have defined us. So in my workplace, as a PhD candidate, I think that we're incredibly diverse. We actually have a lot of different ages and backgrounds, different sexualities, and we come from all over the world. But if you look at other places within the university, or if you look higher up, it's not the same. But does this actually matter? Is this a problem? Often, when we're talking about diversity in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM, we're talking about the women in STEM problem. But diversity goes beyond that. It's not just about gender. Of course, we have inequities in STEM and more widely in society, but diversity is about all genders, all sexualities, all abilities, age, those with different cultural backgrounds, sexualities, those with mental illness. Diversity is about difference, but it's about what brings us together. And when I'm talking about diversity, I'm talking about who we are. So often when we're talking about this lack of diversity, we're talking about what underrepresented people and minorities can do about it. We say they should pursue certain careers or that they should adapt in certain ways to succeed. But the problem is actually systemic. We should value diversity. We know that diverse teams perform better, so what is the problem? Why is this a thing that we have to worry about? There are a number of barriers that are holding us back. And so if I can just tell you about a few of the most critical ones, I would say that these are harassment, discrimination with deep roots in history, resulting in conscious and unconscious bias, stereotyping, accessibility, and a lack of flexibility in workplaces. So, instead of talking about the problems, I actually want to focus on how we can address them today. And so I ask you, do you value diversity? Think about the people in your life. Think about your friends. Think about your workmates. What kind of people are they? What I want us to understand, and what I think the fundamental change that we need here, is, an, is to understand that these problems and these barriers are not from within underrepresented groups and minorities. These are things that we can change together. These are the ways that we treat each other. And we can change that. We do it all the time. I don't treat my family the way I treat my friends, the way I treat my workmates. And if I can give you an example from engineering, we used to have a huge problem with safety in engineering. I've seen some ridiculous photos in presentations and on the internet but it's something that we've addressed by implementing strategies. So we've had to train people to see and address problems and know how to diffuse safety incidents. And this is something that we have done for safety, developing this safety culture, and it's something that we can do for being inclusive as well. And it takes effort, and it takes conscious thought, and it takes learning, but that's the world that I want to live in. I want to live in a world where diversity is something that we celebrate and where equity isn't something that we even have to discuss, but a reality. And wouldn't you want to be a part of that? 
So I want you to think about how diversity can be powerful. How can diversity help us with problem solving? If we have different experiences, if I've got a different experience to you, I'm going to respond to a situation differently. I'm going to see different things. And if we've got diversity, we have different perspectives. We have different ways of thinking, and we can look at problems from different angles. So if we have diversity of representation, we have diversity of thought. And we can reduce potential bias, and we can foster creativity and enable innovation through problem solving. It's not just about these solutions and how we find these solutions, but it's also about the problems themselves and how do we define which problems are worth pursuing. So for me, my passion is sustainability. And I think that in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, we have a huge responsibility as far as expanding the boundaries of what we know. This knowledge, this learning, it should be for society. Our use and development of technology, it should be for humans. It should be about what people need. But when you know, historically in STEM, research and problem solving and products and development, all of those things are defined by limited demographics. It's not representative. And it can become this endemic culture which makes it so hard to think differently. So if we value diversity, what are some initial steps that we can take to address it? I want us to think first about workplaces. And if I can talk about just three strategies, I would say we need to look at addressing harassment, we need to look at addressing um, hiring and promotion, and we need to look at flexibility. And these are just initial steps, but these are what we need to attain and sustain diversity. So step one, and what I believe is the most critical thing here is harassment. We often talk about in STEM how harassment is a huge issue and diversity and a lack of diversity is a massive problem. How are we going to fix it? 75% of the fastest growing jobs are STEM jobs, so what are we going to do when the industries look the way that they are? It doesn't matter how many efforts you might make, how many awards you might give out, how many panels you might hold, how many discussions you're going to give, how many talks. It does not matter if you do not address harassment. It undermines all efforts that you might make. And if people are not safe, then they will leave. So what would you do if you or a colleague experienced something that had to be reported? Where would you go to? Or who would you go to? Would you feel comfortable going to them? And what if that person was involved? Where would you go? Do you have any alternatives? The policies need to be clear, and they need to be accessible. We need to have support and information at the ready, and we need to enforce the policies so that perpetrators of harassment don't just stay within the system. Are you doing enough? Step two is about hiring and promotion. And often when we're talking about this, the idea of meritocracy comes up. A true meritocracy can't exist while systemic bias exists. As it is in our system, we don't have a meritocracy. Our performance isn't totally dictated by merit. If we want to build diverse teams, we're going to have to do it somehow. And this means like looking at the language that we use and the channels where we advertise. This means having diverse panels, but also training those people to check their bias. And that might mean having unconscious bias training or improving in transparency and reviews. But these are all problems that we have to address. And so step three is about flexibility in workplaces. This is really about things like job sharing and part-time work, HR policies to help return to work, adequate parental leave, people won't judge you for taking provisions for childcare. And it's not just about families, but also about those with chronic health conditions, for example. 
And if we have, we want equity in the workplace, we need equity in domestic responsibilities as well. But three steps is not enough. What we need is an inherent cultural change, creating spaces that encourage diversity. And not just in workplaces, but in every opportunity. And I know that cultural change can sound so abstract, so let me give, give you some specific things that we can do to try and make this happen. It starts in your everyday life. Be an ally. This means listening to the experiences of others, educating yourself, providing support where you can. And particularly if you are in a position of privilege, you can call out inappropriate language and actions. And your influence is actually really important in terms of changing mindsets. Observe group behavior, and if you can, address problems like monopolization in conversations or lack of confidence, and allow everyone to voice their thoughts. You can normalize vulnerability by sharing your failures. And this creates a space where we can have discussions about issues like these and they can actually be talked about and not hidden. Raise awareness for problematic and hostile behavior and don't let people get away with things like racist and sexist jokes that might seem harmless but really signal to those who have prejudices that it's okay to discriminate against marginalized people. So I ask you, please, think about yourself. Think about your privilege. And this might be age or gender or race or ability or any of the other things we've mentioned today. And in some spaces, you might have more privilege or less. So think about it often and be aware of it. And it's OK to be privileged, because that means that you have power to make change. And it's not easy, but something I deeply believe in is that if we believe in something and we want to achieve something, we are powerful and we can accomplish it together. Even if it's just doing the smaller things, the simpler ones, just being more aware, if we believe and we can make a change. So we need to commit and action this and not just talk about it. Embracing diversity isn't always a clear path ahead. But if we take these steps and many more, we can move forward together. Thanks.